Director, uh, Professor Silesh Naik, Ambassador P.S. Raghavan, dear friends. Uh, first of all, let me say what a really a great pleasure it is to be back uh, at NIAS. Uh, before I entered the room, I went and saw uh, the plant that I planted five years ago. Uh, I didn't realize it had been so long. Uh, the plant has grown. I'm not sure I have. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the you know I, I really uh, look forward very much to uh, today's interaction and uh, particularly because it's not only you know uh, the NIAS faculty to you know researchers students that I'm meeting but also because by now you have evolved a larger international studies network uh, and I really uh, compliment you uh, for that uh, so uh, let me get down straight away to business uh, and start with uh, the topic, eight years of national security. So I'd like to explain to you, why did I pick that topic, eight years of national security? Because these eight years, actually, you know, you could argue there have been a number of achievements uh, by, by the government uh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi. Uh, many of those achievements are achievements you see every day. Uh, you saw it in a way, in the manner in which we met the COVID challenge, uh, you can see it uh, in terms of uh, today how much uh, more and differently development has uh, unfolded. It could be in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of electricity connection, water connection, housing programs the government does, the cooking gas programs, uh, the, the skill initiative that they have, the girls education initiative that they have. So there are, when you, when you actually look at these eight years, uh, I could have actually pretty much picked one of about a hundred subjects and said, okay, I'd like to talk to you about that today. But I chose national security and I was very conscious of it. I didn't choose foreign policy, okay? I chose national security. And I chose national security uh, because I feel that very often as a country, as a society, we take it for granted. And we take it for granted, if you actually think what national security means, uh, I look at it in terms of the well-being of the country and the society, in terms of protecting against the vulnerabilities uh, that uh, we uh, may face, and in a sense, on a positive way, uh, to enhance our competitiveness. Uh, so if that those are really the goals of our national security. Uh, and I, I again underline the point that I believe that national security is the foundation really for any development and progress of a society. I want you to think for a moment at four challenges that we have all been through in the last few years. The challenge of COVID, and, and they all happen, by the way, uh, you know, at the same proximate uh, timeline. Uh, the challenge of COVID, the challenge of what is happening in our northern borders vis-a-vis -vis China, the challenge of what happened in Afghanistan, the outcome and what implications it has, and now the challenges of the Ukraine conflict and its global repercussions and how that is impacting our lives. And I want you to think that the decisions we made, the courses of action that we chose, uh, the outcomes that resulted, how much different your lives would have been and my life would have been had we done something else. So when I make this point that national security is something uh, which we take as other people do it, it is done somewhere, uh, the, the point uh, I wish to drive home is, it's real, it impacts you, as Ambassador Raghavan said, you know, uh, every day in a more globalized world, uh, the, the uh, external world impacts us more and more. And I want you to be very conscious of it. And where I am concerned uh, as the external affairs minister, uh, obviously the point which I will be making to you is how much uh, diplomacy directly contributes uh, to national security. Now the next question which I ask myself and which I know would be of interest to you is you will ask me why Bangalore? You know, why have you come 
with this thought to Bangalore? And uh, my most honest answer to you is one great virtue of Bangalore is it is out of Delhi. So, uh, so that itself is a reason uh, to come out. But that's not the only virtue. Uh, so I also, you know, we want to, uh, you know, from on part of the government to send out the message that all of you are stakeholders in national security and everything associated with it. So it should not, national security should not be a debate in Delhi for Delhi by Delhi. In the Ministry of External Affairs some years ago, we set up something called the States Division. You know, typically in bureaucracy, what happens, people say, okay, States Division means you must be dealing with correspondence uh, uh, involving, you know, state governments. Yes, we do. But we wanted to send home the message that we actually want to democratize foreign policy because when you actually are in different parts of India, and that is something uh, when I go out to different corners of India, I feel that the, the how you perceive the world also depends on which part of India uh, you are in, your priorities adjust uh, uh, to that accordingly. But the third reason why I wanted to come and speak in Bangalore and in Yas uh, specifically was, I do think that Bangalore, uh, specifically Bengaluru and uh, Karnataka, you know, it is today, uh, I mean, no disrespect intended to anybody else and I'm neither representing the state nor am I an, uh, uh, origi you know, my origins lie in it. So it's a very objective statement. I think this is really one of the most progressive states in India and certainly Bengaluru is one of the most, not only one of the most progressive cities, it actually to the rest of the world is like a poster child of Indian modernity. And I felt in such an arena, it is very important to understand what national security uh, is about. And of course, you are all super connected. So, uh, you know, therefore, you should really know what the external world means. So, the, the second message I have to you is when you think, first of all, don't make assumptions. I mean, be aware of national security. Number two, think of national security as a whole of a society, whole of a nation. Uh, enterprise, uh, because uh, I think a lot of, uh, you know, our uh, history and our future will depend really on our, how strong that whole of the nation feeling is. Uh, I, I, you know, there's a, always a debate uh, on this unity, diversity, balance. Uh, my sense of history is that where our sense of unity has been very strong, uh, India has always done well, and certainly that is the direction this government uh, would like to go. Now, I have a, also a particular word for students of international relations. Ambassador Raghavan and I discussed it briefly uh, a little while ago. You know, I studied international relations too. And one of the challenges when you look at actual situations is you try to force fit what you study uh, onto real life. That you look at real life situations and you say, yes, but this doesn't match what I was taught or what I was learned. So one advice as a practitioner of international st studies, having uh, studied it, uh, is it's important for concepts really to grow with life, to, to learn from life, to learn from practice. Uh, and I'm sure your analysis of international relations would be more accurate, much richer, more nuanced, if you actually took the complexities of life uh, uh, into, into your calculations. So let me come to this point, you know, why did I choose the word national security, the term national security, rather than foreign policy or diplomacy? Because my sense is, even today, many of us, when we think of national security, we have an imagery of, you know, a soldier guarding our borders, or maybe a policeman, you know, a black cat kind of policeman, uh, or special forces dealing with the terrorists. So we associate it with a very old fashioned, limited, hard security uh, kind of thinking. Maybe, you know, as you grow, uh, as you kind of uh, think bigger, people 
sometimes look at nuclear issues and say, okay, that is national security. But again, I want you to reflect on national security through the lens of those four challenges, the challenges which have happened in the last two years, in the time since I, I was last in years. And think of what the national security implications of those are. Let's take COVID, okay? We were able to produce made in India vaccines in a large way. We were even able to produce an invented in India vaccine, which by the way, I had in my arm, as did the prime minister. We were able to produce, we were not just able to make it in India and invent it in India, we were also able to inject it in India because let me tell you, a lot of countries struggled actually with the process of vaccinating the people. So we were able to get a kind of vaccination drive done in a very, very successful way. So I just think for a moment, what would have happened if this was not the case? had our ability to produce vaccines not been as good as it was. If our turn in the queue, so to speak, came later, which by the way has happened to many countries, what would have been the consequences for our societal fabric and therefore for our national security? Had we not been able to produce the outcomes that we did during the time of COVID, I want you to reflect on it. But before we even got to vaccination, we saw another aspect of national security. You know, in, in a way for 2020 and 2021, I can say, yes, I was the Minister of External Affairs, but I was also like some of my other colleagues who were in a COVID group. We were all also ministers of COVID affairs, that a lot of our time went in contributing to a larger national purpose under the Prime Minister's leadership on how do we respond to the COVID. And we scrambled in 2020. You know, we were looking for masks, we were looking for PPEs, we were looking for ventilators, we were looking for uh, medicines, we were looking for APIs to make the medicines. And you asked yourself, is it not dangerous for our national security that we are so dependent on external sources and that this belief that there is a just-in-time economy which will deliver smoothly every day, 24-7, 365 days a year. The COVID told us that was not the case. So when we think national security, certainly from the COVID, no question, we now think health security. But I now ask you, should we not be thinking manufacturing security? And in a sense connected with it, employment security. And have we not slid into a kind of a comfort level where we feel we will get things from the world, you know, we will fit it in our top lines, we will post our 8% growth, uh, you know, companies will do well, but actually we are not developing the deep strengths, we are not developing the, the supply chains within the country so that in a moment of crisis, we were not left as vulnerable as we were uh, in those years. Let me move to another issue, which also happened at this time, which was uh, the Chinese massing forces and uh, unilaterally trying to change the status quo on the line of actual control uh, in the Ladakh sector. Now, here again, when we think, I mean, look back uh, over these last two years, we've actually had Indian forces uh, uh, deployed there under very, very, probably the toughest conditions that you can find anywhere on this planet uh, in very large numbers who are standing their ground uh, and in that sense ensuring that national security uh, is, is uh, achieved. Now, what is the enabler to do that? The enabler to do that today, if they were able to do it today, and, and you have to understand the scale of really what has happened in the last two years. I mean, if you look at the deployment of forces uh, in that sector, it is actually the biggest deployment probably we have done since the 1962 war. So the idea that so many troops could go there and be maintained there logistically uh, over two winters now uh, has been because of the infrastructure progress that we have made. In fact, it is the fact that in the in the border areas, the, the speed of our infrastructure de uh, uh, development 
has been two to three times of what it used to be before in the last eight years. That is really what has enabled our troops to be deployed out there. So again, when you think national security, a road that we build, our ability to make tunnels, to, you know, uh, to, to build bridges, these are also very much a part of our national security. I mean, without the, the, the appropriate infrastructure, uh, and if there are actually efforts at delaying or derailing the building of infrastructure, especially in border areas, you should ask yourself, is that not a weakening of your national security? So, and it isn't, I mean, I'm citing to you infrastructure, but it's also a case where actually diplomacy uh, was very much in evidence that our ability to access the right kind of equipment for troops to stay there in the winter was also a contribution uh, to, to national security. So let me move to the third issue, which was Afghanistan. Now, we saw what happened uh, on August 15th last year, and the impact it had on radicalization uh, uh, across a much larger area. Now, I'm not specifically saying something necessarily out of Afghanistan is going to, uh, in some way, negatively impact us. It could, it need not also. But it tells you the power of ideas. It tells you today how ideas in a connected world, in a, in a much more uh, uh, networked, literally networked world, have actually, you know, the, there were times when people, people, you'd say, somebody has to go somewhere to get radicalized. Today you hear this word self-radicalized people. And, you know, some of what happened uh, in Sri Lanka, for example, some very violent actions were done by self-radicalized people. So the power today of ideas, of, of radical ideas, often violent ideas, traveling without physical travel actually changes your entire concept of national security. So physical barriers and controls are no longer a sufficient uh, defense. They still have their place, but they are no longer sufficient. And finally, let me uh, draw your attention to the implications of uh, the situation for, uh, in Ukraine, the conflict there. Uh, for, the, for a large part of the world, including us, today it shows up in what we call a 3F crisis, fuel, food, and fertilizers. That these three, prices of these three have gone up. They have a very significant inflationary impact. Uh, in the case of food, they will actually lead to hunger situations. In the case of fertilizer, it will create a cascading problem down the road. So the next harvest in many countries are, are going to be uh, endangered. So it tells you again how something far away uh, has actually a direct implication on our well-being. In some cases, how it increases our vulnerability. Uh, and as I said, it could even actually impact our competitiveness. So I want you to really imagine national security as something not country, borders, and beyond the borders. This is the entire world, actually, which can today come to your home in different ways. It can come as a virus, it can come as a cost of petrol, it can come as a shortage of food, it can be a problem with fertilizers, it can come as a radical idea in your neighborhood, or, you know, it is something which could come because in your country, the system was not geared to give the right responses when uh, it was being threatened uh, from outside. So what is the answer? The answer obviously, since it is so comprehensive, is to actually, is the concept of comprehensive national power. Many of you know it, uh, understand it. And I want you to appreciate that in this eight years of the Modi government, what we have tried to do is actually to build India comprehensively. I can, you know, when I told you at the start that there were many things I could talk about. Girls' education, you know, uh, Skills India, Digital India, uh, Swachh Bharat. Each one of them is a dot. I want you to connect these dots. If you connect these dots, you will realize that there is actually a holistic vision, integrated vision of what our comprehensive national power should be. 
and that comprehensive natural power first of all is dependent on improving the quality of human resources it's a very people centric uh, approach and uh, in a way i can in international relations parlance i can say if we are successful in implementing our sustainable development goals by the end of this decade i can tell you we will revolutionize india that you will see immediately already we have seen even in these eight years we have seen a big change in the gender ratio in india it's it's a very remarkable change you know there are other societies which have really struggled to change the direction in which that gender ratio has been moving and the fact that we've actually been able to make uh, that much progress is not a small achievement but there are other other areas i mean if you today look for us today it could be nutrition it could be education it could be health access it could be Uh, school admission school retention uh, skills employability innovation as you go up the ladder every bit matters so when you hear of programs which are done by the government uh, and and uh, you know if you look at the scale of these programs many of these programs are actually bigger than populations of entire continents leave alone countries so it's when i when i say of the things we take for granted i think you all also must appreciate in the last 8 years things really transformational things have been happening around you and if you connect up the dots of this you will understand the scale uh, of that transformation so where does diplomacy fit in all of this uh, diplomacy i mean you know first of all for any system or any society creates awareness you know tells you okay these are the dangers in the world these are the opportunities in the world uh, when you start to employ it idea is obviously you leverage it you try and get things from the world technology capital best practices collaborations it helps to build relationships uh, because often like we do as human beings when you get into trouble or uh, when you want things those with whom you have better relations Uh, are more responsive than others it's a it's a very essential part of communication because we are actually dealing uh, with a cross cultural world where what i say is not necessarily what you may hear or understand uh, and uh, uh, at the same time it also in a way messages intent it messages capabilities it has a deterring effect because in where where there are challenges diplomacy sometimes can very clearly radiate the message saying don't do it and that's as you can understand a message which is often sent by us to our western neighbor uh, or sometimes you diplomacy can be a preventive it can head off uh, problems or when problems happen it can even be a, a solution uh, finder so when you think in orthodox terms of you know national security and a soldier i put it to you the diplomacy in a way stands before the soldier but it also stands behind the soldier so it tries to head off situations where a soldier will be needed but if a soldier is needed it is also fully supportive of the soldier and make sure that the soldier is successful in the execution of what he has been given to do so what has been the last 8 year record and i'll just very quickly sum it up because i want to keep more time for the q and a's i i think uh, if you if you look at the more obvious issues uh, it it's a record which has been very firm uh, it's been a very steady record uh, when it comes to a perennial challenge which is uh, pakistan and their uh, sponsorship of cross border terrorism i think you've seen a degree of clarity that you know uh, we will not be brought to the table by the pressure of cross border terrorism and when that has crossed limits i think you have also seen responses uh, as in the case of uri and balakot where china is concerned uh, as i said you know we are again very clear that uh, we will not allow uh, the uh, line of actual control to be changed unilaterally and in violation of understandings that we have Uh, and therefore we will stand our ground uh, very strongly uh, and uh, uh, we will while standing our ground also engage the chinese so that uh, where uh, the deployments are particularly dangerous uh, we at least find a way of defrictionalizing that in a way 
Uh, one very, uh, I would say, important achievement of these eight years was actually the land boundary agreement uh, with Bangladesh. It's had an enormous uh, impact on the India-Bangladesh relationship. Uh, it has really opened up huge possibilities for Bangladesh, for all our northeastern states. So our ability today to uh, move goods, uh, have people travel, uh, to supply electricity, power, energy, uh, all that has really, and it's shown up in trade figures. But it is also what it has done is it's created a much more peaceful Northeast. Uh, and uh, uh, elements who previously uh, uh, thought they could uh, get shelter there obviously uh, don't anymore. Similarly, where Myanmar is concerned, again, uh, we've had a foreign policy that has engaged the regime and made it very difficult for Indian insurgent groups to operate there. Uh, on, the, on a different front, the oceanic front, there's actually been, uh, again, a sea change, if you'll pardon the pun, in thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see today from the days when we sort of uh, were very hands off, even with very immediate neighbors like Sri Lanka. Uh, today, you can see how much more integrated our view is of what we call a Sagar policy. Uh, with the big powers, I think we have been quite successful in engaging all of them uh, and ensuring that you know our national interest is best served. Uh, it can be done in new forms of engagement, uh, like you can see unfolding in the case of the Quad. Uh, in fact, now not one, but we have a emerging uh, grouping of four, four countries on the West as well. Uh, but also in situations like Ukraine, where you know we have been very clear diet uh, about what the issues are and what our interests are, and how do we strike a proper balance uh, between that. Uh, where the, uh, we've also developed a sense of an extended neighborhood, which is uh, the uh, Southeast Asia, that was already developing from the 1990s, but we have taken it further, but now much more towards the Gulf and towards Central Asia. Uh, in a sense, you could say these, this was our neighborhood of pre-partition India. Uh, of, of, you can say, civilizational India. So I think today uh, that is very much uh, uh, underway uh, in, in an area which should be of particular interest uh, to NIAS. If you look at the technology world, again, there's much more uh, activity. Uh, you actually have a government which certainly looks at space-based space, cha space -based challenges and cyber challenges uh, much more seriously and much more effectively. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have, you know, joined regimes like uh, MTCR and Vasanar and Australia Group. Uh, and there is a sense today that technology is, should be very much at the heart of our uh, engagement with the world. We've also tried to influence the big global debates, uh, both through negotiations and through initiatives like the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. And and you know, as a, as a society, we have actually tried uh, now, and I would say with some degree of success here, to, to uh, you know, I, I would say the right word would be perhaps to, uh, to enhance the India branding. That on the world stage, the idea of a civilizational sta state uh, with a old culture and heritage, which has a lot to contribute, and this can happen, you know, in terms of uh, uh, International Day of Yoga or, you know, traditional medicine, Ayurveda, or it can happen even in, in uh, debates on democracy. The, so that sense that there is, there is a almost, I would say, a kind of eternal India out there which today has great value for the world. And uh, in my view, uh, there is also an X factor, which is that if, you know, as someone who who really goes to a lot of international events and spends time uh, with leaderships of other countries. Very honestly, I would say to you, in these eight years, uh, our stock has grown up. And uh, among the reasons uh, for that is all you have to do is to look at a television screen and see that what the prime minister is doing. So the, the point I would conclude with is that the next time you think about international relations, Think about politics. Uh, yes, uh, analyze, diligence, understanding, 
all of that is important but also give weight to a vision the ability to deliver on it and to have a decisive leadership which makes all of that possible because i believe that in the last 8 years all of us you me our dear ones and your ones uh, are far more secure and safe uh, and i certainly uh, am confident that that will be the direction in which the government will continue to go so thank you once again for your attention